It is a wonderful honor to welcome Robert McBain on this program. He is the author of a fascinating book titled Lonely Dead of an Ojibwe Boy about the tragic passing of one Charlie Wenjack. And of course, I've read an excerpt of the book in the website Quillette, and that's how I got introduced to the author as well as the book. Robert, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you for having me on, and thank you for expressing interest in the book. Yes. Um, so my first introduction to Charlie Wenjack is uh, when I attended um, Trent University, uh, which I studied for four years. And there was a theater there named after him, uh, Wenjack Theater, although uh, uh, it was more common for people to call him Cheney Wenjack than Charlie Wenjack. So I got um, a bit... Uh, of the detail in regards to, say, the legend, so to speak, of of Wenjack. So, if you if you can, how would you summarize it, and how would you, uh, what are some of the details of that legend that, uh, I suppose, are unsupported by the facts? Well, part of the problem is the use of the word Cheney, mm -hmm. because the authors of the book Secret Path claim that his name was Cheney and that the school changed it to Charlie. His family has never at any point in his life called him Cheney. So I have no idea where they came with Cheney, but on the buildings that bear his name in all the media interviews and on the theater, it's Cheney, despite the fact as recently as uh, just a couple of years ago, the two sisters were at a school in Toronto and a young Chinese Canadian boy looked a bit like their brother. And the sister Pearl said, oh, that's Charlie. She didn't say, oh, that's Janie. Hmm. And then she kept saying how much like Charlie he is. When the family, like they do have events, and when the family come out, they wear blue t-shirts and they had the name Charlie Wenjack on their t-shirts and on his grave at Ogogi Post, it says in loving memory, Charles Wenjack. So I haven't the foggiest idea where this Cheney thing came from, but unfortunately he stuck with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, like I said, how would you summarize the legend of uh, Charlie Wenjack and to what extent have the details of the legend have uh, been supported by the facts? The main problem is that the key person in the project is Gord Downey. Mm -hmm. And at the time when she went, since you went to the school yourself at Trent, uh, Downey is an icon in Canada. And unfortunately, he had a terminal brain tumor and he was dying. So he made this his last life's work. And he was very much influenced by Charlie's older sisters, Earl Hatchney Pinescam and Daisy Monroe. And as far back as 1990, they have been spinning a false story about their brother. They both went to the school. They know it's a Presbyterian school, but even back in a book that came out in 1990, they have it as a Catholic school. Why in the world they want to have a Catholic school, I don't know. But it's very clear, in fairness to Downey and his brother Mike, that they bought the story that the sisters gave to them. But when I do my research, I find out that 80% of what they have to say just did not happen. And unfortunately, we have generations of children now who are being taught this false story about Charlie. A death, which as you've read from my excerpt, was something that could have been prevented if three adults had acted in a responsible manner. Charlie Wenjack did not need to die. <laughs> yes. Um, so for those who do not know the, the legend, I suppose uh, I can summarize it by uh, yeah, what I know is that um, he was uh, 14 years old at that time. 12. Oh, 12, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, so 12, and he was a student at a residential school, um, Cecilia Jeffrey. 
and it was uh it was in northern Ontario, I believe. It was about that we have a huge body of water called the Lake of the Woods. Mm -hmm. Kenora is at the tip, northern tip of the Lake of the Woods, and it's about 50 kilometers east off the border with Manitoba. So it's right up there in what we call northwestern Ontario. Mm -hmm. And the school was located on the outskirts of the town at mm -hmm. a place called Round Lake. So um, one day uh, in the year 1966, he ran away from the school and um, he he didn't go too far and he was found dead uh, on his way. And um, you know, legend has it that he was trying to return to his parents. And and the story of Wenjack is um, kind of um, a symbol of uh, the oppressiveness of the Canadian residential school system against uh, its indigenous population. So I think uh, one should begin by uh, uh, having a brief history of what the residential schools were and what this specific school was, Cecilia Jeffrey. The residential schools that we're talking about now started in in the 1880s. And what happened was that Canada, when it became a confederation in 1867, the vast majority of the country was not included. It only included what is now Ontario, Quebec, uh, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Huge swaths, all of what is now Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company. It didn't actually belong to them, but they had exclusive trading rights. Those rights were granted to them in 1670 by the King of England. So what happened was that when we had Confederation, they then, about three years later, purchased from the Hudson's Bay Company their trading rights, which means now Canada would include all of this. At that time, eight, let's say 1870, we had approximately three and a half million Canadians between Thunder Bay, which is at Lake Superior, and the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. There was about 40,000 Ojibwe's, Crees, Blackfoot. So now we have to, there, there, there's never been one incident of a war as in the United States between Canada and the indigenous people. It was a very peaceful thing. And they had been working hand in hand, we'll say, with the Hudson's Bay Company for 200 years, trading their furs, very astute traders. At many times, the indigenous traders would play off the Hudson's Bay Company with the Northwest Company in order to get the best price. So it wasn't a question of trying to pacify them, but it was a question that the buffalo upon which they had depended for thousands of years was almost depleted. So as part of the treaty negotiations, the chiefs recognized that their children would benefit from learning what they called the white man's ways, how to read, how to write, farming, etc. So that is why in 1883, they started setting up schools in Western Canada. And those schools were set up with a racist intent because the purpose of the schools, according to the prime minister, his ministers and the civil servants was to separate the children from their families, from their culture, from their language. The overall record of the schools was absolutely horrendous. And that is what disturbed me the most about Charlie's story because the school he went to was one of the very few exceptions that proved the rule. So if they want to do a, a story portraying the horrible traumatic effect residential schools had on Indigenous children, there were hundreds of other cases they could have used. Why they took Charlie, I don't know, because in the excerpt, in the late 50s, they started integrating the Indigenous children with white children. And some white children from Kenora actually went to that residential school. Now, if it was this horrid 
place, this chamber of horrors, uh, of, uh, horrors everybody says, there's no way the white parents in Kenora would have had their children going to that school. It was a great school. The children loved, they are felt loved, felt cared for. Some of them called the principal and his wife, mom and dad, signed their letters love. And Charlie, I have seen absolutely no evidence anywhere of him being abused emotionally, physically, or sexually at that school. There was, and so therefore you use the term run away. There was, there was nothing for him to run away from. He left on a whim because one of his friends wanted to visit his uncle who had a trapping cabin about 30 kilometers north. He had nothing else to do that day. A beautiful, sunny Sunday afternoon. It wasn't even a school day. So his best friend testified at the inquest that when they decided, the two brothers, to go and visit their uncle, Charlie, quote, tagged along. That he had he had two sisters at the school. Actually, he had three sisters at the school. So if this very lonely boy has finally decided he's going to run away to go and be with his family, you'd think at least he would have gone to his sisters and said, hey, I'm going home. Uh, he had no contact with them because he had no intention of going to his home. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I know that uh, in recent years, there was a controversy surrounding... Um famous university in Toronto, um, formerly known uh, as of this recording as Ryerson University, named after Edgerton Ryerson, and they changed it now to Toronto Metropolitan. Um, so to what extent was uh, Ryerson, at, as was accused by you know, our contemporaries, to be involved in the residential school system? I, I suggest you have to separate the schools into two Eras. In the early 1830s, we had a school called the Mohawk Institute at the Six Nations Reserve in Brantford. And then, <clears throat> sorry, 90, sorry, 1850, they opened another school at Mount Elgin, which is just south of London, Ontario. So that's two schools. Those schools were promoted by Ojibwe's who had Chris, who had converted to Christianity, they were welcomed by the by the bands. The Mohawks, for example, provided about two hundred acres of land for the Mohawk Institute. When they opened the Mount Elgin School, about five hundred Ojibwe's and Munsees and Anidas showed up. Most of whom who were already converted Christians and celebrated the opening of the schools. Now, Ryerson at that time was what we call the father of public education in Ontario. He was the first one to push for free education for all people. And he had no involvement whatsoever with Indians like indigenous children because under the constitution, the federal government is responsible for Indians, and lands reserved for Indians. Now, because he was such a successful educator, one of the officials at the Department of Indian Affairs sent him a letter and saying, hey, would you give us a few suggestions about how these schools should be operated? They had, this was in March, 1847. A year before in July, the chiefs had had a meeting with the Indigenous Affairs, and it all agreed that they would have what they then called manual training schools. So the, the fact that the schools were coming was established. What this Indian Affairs official wanted to know was, hey, based on your expertise, how do you think we should go about establishing the curriculum, et cetera? Ryerson waited two months, and then he apologized in his letter, said, I'm sorry, I couldn't take time away from official business. So he's not doing this as the superintendent of education. He's doing it as Egerton Ryerson, citizen with an expertise in education. And he sent him some, some suggestions. And that's it. There's a friend of mine, a Dr. Donald Smith, who is a professor, probably recognized as the most informed expert on Indigenous Affairs. And he states in his book, that was it. Egerton had nothing else what to do. Now, what happened 
was in 1894, when they were getting the schools going, the superintendent, the, the, the cabinet minister in charge of Indian Affairs, had somebody type up Egerton Ryerson's handwritten letter, put a cover on it saying, Report on Industrial Schools by Dr. Egerton Ryerson. There, there is no report, but they falsified to make it look like he approved of these schools. And when I talked about two eras, the schools that were established by the federal government in the 1880s were altogether different than the schools that were there when Dr. Ryerson was there. He was very falsely tried, and I wish to goodness he'd been alive in order he could have stated his own case. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, of course, uh, um, a few other recent controversies in regards to Indigenous history concern, um, I believe in 2021, where um, a series of mass graves were discovered in British Columbia. And... I I caution you on the use of the word yes. Mark Graves. They, yes, they, I, they, I, I, they I discovered up, so. anomalies. Yes. Yes. Um, and as you know, this is ground penetrating radar. Mm -hmm. Ground penetrating radar, radar can tell you, hey, there's been a disturbance in the soil, but it can't tell you if that is a coffin or an irrigation tile or what it is. But what they did say, they found first. 215. Then when she found out there had been some previous excavation in the site, she reduced it to 200. So they found out, yes, we found 200 anomalies. But next thing you know, the New York Times is telling the world about the discovery of a mass grave. Yeah. And it just took off from there. But here we are three years ago this month. And so far, we do not have one grave, one coffin, one corpse, one skeleton, nothing. And this whole thing, I would suggest, because the government has spent millions of dollars giving bands money to dig up. Oh, you, you have seen archaeologists very carefully digging down two or three feet to, to those not disturbed. All they had to do was dig down two or three feet. What is it? Is it a bone? Is it a coffin? Is it an irrigation tile? But to this very day, they haven't put one shovel in the ground at what's called the Kamloops Indian Band. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, I, I was uh, using the term mass grave. And I wasn't challenging you, but just... Yes, I, I understand. Too, too many people say mark gra unmarked graves. Yes. Which, uh -huh. by the way, doesn't mean they're not graves. Maybe mm -hmm. they were graves. I know up in Kenora, when I, I do, I used to be a consultant for the Department of Indian Affairs. I've traveled to a lot of places, and most of the cemeteries have white crosses with no names on them. Mm -hmm. There could very well have been graves there with crosses, which by the maybe there's a prairie fire, what have you, they're gone. But so I, I wasn't challenging you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was just saying that I. I was using the, the phrase uh, mass graves or unmarked graves, as you've mentioned, uh, somewhat facetiously, because um, uh, I think later reportings, um, uh, one notable reporter is uh, Terry Glavin from National Post. Mm. He has uh, debunked uh, this legend that uh, unfortunately has been so widely circulated. Um, I remember I was in Ontario at that time. I was finishing my second year despite COVID. Mm. And the uh, slogan that was um, arise uh, arose right afterwards was "Every Child Matters," and yes, yeah, it was um, obviously a similar slogan to you know, "Black Lives Matter" in the U.S. So Canada is trying to do something Very similar. Much so. yep, yep. But uh, of course, the facts do not hold up to scrutiny, and I wonder, um, I wonder why, especially in these recent times, have uh, there been falsehoods about? Um, say, stories that may have been true, say, the Wenjack story, as well as the Kamloops, uh, BC uh, area, about um, Indigenous affairs and history? Well, I, as you know, I've done quite a bit of research. Back in the early days, the Department of Indian Affairs, because the schools were based on a per capita grant, OK, so you have to prove that the indigenous child is in the school 
before the government's going to give you any money. So a school is designed for 100 students, and they need 100 students. Like the budget is for 100 students. They need 100. Every quarter, there will be reports from Indian Affairs of student X, how old he is, where he's from, et cetera. If a child died, <laughs> let me cough. If a child died, it was up to the Indian Affairs agent to A, have a certificate or a note from the doctor. How did the child die? What if any effort was made to keep the child alive? If it was an accident, there's an onus on the Indian agent to interview any witnesses and also to write a report. And then they have to put down where the child was placed. From a pure business point of view, I, as a government, I'm not going to pay you for children that aren't there. So we have documentation of every single child who went to school. The problem is the schools were back in the 1880s. So why in, say, 2005, would the government want to hold on records from 1890 or from 1930 or so? So a lot of the records are gone. But the bottom line is we have no, I believe, no reports whatsoever of parents saying, oh, my God, my child hasn't come back from school, contacting the police, contacting Indian Affairs, contacting the school. What happened to my little girl or my little boy? Nothing. And then all of a sudden, in 2021, we have the prime minister lowering the flags at half mass for, I think it was seven months because of these anomalies. And all of a sudden, we have stories. Yes, the uh, former chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Murray Sinclair, who became a senator. There's probably 15,000. Well, well, how come nobody has ever said, even if there was 1,500, where are they? Why haven't they come home? And so I can't answer your question, but I do believe it's a case of a false story picking up legs and just taking off and we're stuck with it. Okay. okay. Um, so going back to- And your... also it, it's good leverage because we, we have, I would call it a grievance industry. There, there is, I know from going to reserves, there are some absolutely appalling conditions, but we also have people who use those conditions to get money from the government or for other programs. And we had the chief of the Kamloops band when she was at the Vatican, holding the Canadian flag upside down with genocide marked on it. There, there's no reason for that. But, but anyway, that's where we're at. Yes, I, I know that um, the Pope uh, you know, made a passing acknowledgement of uh, the um, the so-called unmarked grace affair as well. Around yes, that. and he actually called it genocide because mm -hmm. he he did not use the word genocide during his meetings with the um, various bands that he went, etc. But when he was on his plane, somebody said to him, a reporter, um, would you call it genocide. You you haven't used the word genocide. And he said, yes, it, it was a genocide. Um, now, I'm not sure if he's talking about the graves or if he's talking about, as some others have done, that the whole residential school system was a genocide. And the commissioners, all three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said later they wanted to use the term genocide, but they were told by the lawyers they couldn't do that. So they called it cultural genocide. Mm -hmm. But yes, as far as the Chinese, for example, we are a genocidal nation and we shouldn't be talking to them about the Uyghurs and mm -hmm. all their human rights abuses because we're our own prime minister says we committed, we were complicit in genocide, which would include his father because the schools were still going in 1968 when Pierre Trudeau was prime minister right up until 1984. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... So I guess uh, I I like to pass along that question to you. Um, do you consider the residential school system as a whole to be an instance of well, cultural genocide, or I suppose even physical genocide? I as I said earlier, 
the clear intent of the schools was to separate the children from their parents. That's why one of the Indian Affairs <clears throat> officials at the time said that it has to be as remote as possible from the reserves. During the first more than 30 years of operation, the children were not allowed vacations because both the Indian Affairs officials and the church officials said, hey, if we let them go back there, we're going to lose all the benefit that we'd gain because they'll be exposed to their savage parents again and they'll be back. We had one of the uh, Duncan Campbell Scott saying they wanted to separate them from indigenous culture, traditions, and beliefs. So given that the schools were set up to separate them from the culture, given that we have many instances where the schools were allowing the children to speak in their native language, they would be reprimanded by Indian affairs. So there's no doubt at all that thousands and thousands of children lost their language and their culture because of the schools. Um, I, I wouldn't have the, when, when in 1948, they came out with the convention on genocide, there was discussion about cultural genocide. And I think properly at the time, Canada, the United States and Britain said, well, if you, if you use the word genocide for cultural genocide, you're diminishing the real genocide, which because they were just after the Holocaust. That was a genocide. The Armenians were subjected to a genocide. The Rwandans were subjected to a genocide. So what they were saying is not to deny any assault on the culture, but to use the word genocide diminishes the real meaning of genocide. And so from that point of view, I would say, no, it was not either a... Mind you, they don't mean physical genocide. <laughs> Under... Section 2C, I think, is or 2-something, the forcible removal from one group to another. And what they were talking about was how the Nazis took thousands and thousands of Polish children from their homes and had them put into German homes to Germanize them, to make them separate. But they didn't get to go home for summer vacation. Our children, our Indigenous children, they did go home, and they went home after... Most of them spent maybe three, four years at the school. They went home. So, so, so you couldn't, in my mind, use any genocide term with respect to the residential schools. That said, they did fundamentally far more harm than any good that they did. They, they could have had those kids in the reserves going to day schools. Uh, when they talk about they're so isolated, well, the Ukrainian kids on the prairies, they were isolated too, but they got an education. The Finnish kids up in Northern Ontario got an education. There was no reason to separate a seven-year-old child from her mother and have her waking up in this institution and saying, how in the world would my mother let me go into a place like this? So overall, I think the residential school system could have been dealt with in a much more humane manner. Yes. Um, so before we go back to uh, Charlie's story, um, Tell us a bit about the um, the widespread instances of um, you know, physical and emotional and sexual abuse. Sometimes all three that um, that is have reported to have been occurred in these schools. Um, it is documented fact. It's it's the um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which is a fifty million dollar exercise in nineteen. 96, I think they started, um, they did not interview any students. So their report was not based on what some 50-year-old recalls happening when he or she was seven. It was all based on reports by Indian Affairs officials, by social service officials, etc. And on the basis of that report about the physical, the emotional, and the sexual abuse, there wasn't that much about sexual abuse at that time, but about the abuse, the government of Prime Minister Jean Chrétien in January 1998 issued an apology to the Indigenous students and set up a $350 million, quote, healing strategy. Well, 
if there wasn't something to heal, you wouldn't need a $350 million healing strategy. So it was abundantly clear that altogether too many children were subjected to emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. And that was just a documented fact. Okay. Um, tell us about the um, the Indigenous heritage of Charlie Wenchak, the Ojibwe people, who, or I would, uh, I think it was more commonly referred to as Anishinaabe uh, in my University of Trent. Yes, they do that. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, the Ojibwe's, according to research that I've conducted, were originally from the Atlantic coast up near the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And in the early 1600s, the Iroquois drove them out of their ancient villages on the Atlantic coast. The Ojibwas in turn moved west and removed the Dakotas and the Foxes from their rich gaming territories in the area around Lake Superior. And in fact, one of the books talks about how they drove them all the way west of the Mississippi River. So the, the Ojibwas, I think it was back in the uh, early 1600s, some of the early French explorers said they had no, no idea there was such a thing as an Ojibwe. So, but the Ojibwas are, they're not even indigenous to Ontario because what happened was in uh, what we call the Beaver Wars of the 1650s. And this is where the French are trading with their indigenous people and the British are trading with their indigenous people. The Mohawks who first traded with the Dutch and then with the English, they ran out of beavers. So they moved north and they drove the neutrals, the Petons and the Hurons out of Ontario. They, 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 it wasn't, but at that time, Ontario stopped maybe around Lake Superior, okay? And then about now, here's the Ojibwas. And then the Mississaugas, who were living north of Lake Huron, they got together with the Ottawas and some other bands, and they then, starting in 1696, pushed south. And they pushed the Ojibwas, sorry, the Mohawks, all the way back to their territory in the what's now upstate New York. From that time on, about 1700, there was hardly anybody Indigenous in Ontario. In fact, in Upper Canada, around, I think it was 1840, we had about 500,000 whites and less than 10,000 Indigenous people. So the, uh, the Indigenous people were very close to the French. Um, they called the French king father. They traded in Montreal. Um, they had a very, very good deal with the French. There was no animosity between the French and the Ojibwas. But then when the British took over in 1763, they, according to the Ojibwas, looked down on them as dogs. And they stopped giving them presents and stopped giving that. So the Ojibwas say, screw that. And they got together with Pontiac, and that's when they started Pontiac Wars of the 1763s, trying to push the whites back. So from the point of view of what we call culture, <clears throat> I would say by, by the 1880s, the overwhelming majority of indigenous people were already Christianized. And they so so therefore they, they were they were Christians and that's and as far as the <laughs> the culture I'm Scottish and I don't think my picked ancestors had very much of a quote culture we ran around painted our faces blue wore animal skins um, and I don't think there's all that much difference between the picts and the Ojibwe's on the other. So, so I would never write a book about Scottish clan culture because there wasn't very much. I think there were just people like you and me who went about their lives, except they made their living by hunting, by fishing, by gathering and stuff like that. But, but I, there's no, 
way, way, way back then, Scottish culture, and I don't think there was an Ojibwe one either. <laughs> yes. So that'll um, probably get me 10 points off. <laughs> I, I read much about uh, the saying, uh, Catherine Tekakwitta, uh, I hope I pronounced her last name correctly. She she was one of the most famous um, converts to Christianity from um, uh, yeah, from Say Indian Kat origin. Katari. Okay. Katari. Say yes. She was the 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 Iroquois, the Mohawks, were originally from the Mohawk Valley in New York, what is now New York State, Upper New York State, um, around where Albany is now, which used to be called Orange when the Dutch were there, and she converted to Catholicism. And at that time, the Iroquois Confederacy had no use whatsoever for these Catholic converts, and it was considered that they were in danger. So I think it was around 1697, a group of Mohawk Catholic converts took the canoes and went up the Hudson River through what was then Lake St. George, which later became Champlain, and they went to a Jesuit mission across the river from Montreal. And then later on, they moved to what is called Kanawaki and Kanasataki, and some of them moved further west to near Cornwall, Aquasacity. So there was a time when it was believed that she had a very bad case of acne. She had stuff all over her face. And at the time of her death, it cleared up. And they thought this had to be a miracle. And so that was the initial thing that drew the attention of the Catholic Church to her. And then I understand she did two or three miracles and was eventually canonized. So at Kanawaki, which as you'll remember, the Oka crisis of 1990, the people at Kanawaki shut down the bridge between them and Montreal to support the people up at Kanasataki. But there's actually a shrine to her at Kanawaki. And one good friend of mine, former Grand Chief Andrew DeLille, he was in the Cat Kateri um, Hospital or something or other. So she's very much revered in the Mohawk community of Kanawaki. Okay. Um, so going back to uh, Charlie Wenjack, um, so was his enrollment to Cecilia Jeffrey um, a voluntary decision? I'm sorry? Uh, was his enrollment to the residential school, uh, Cecilia Jeffrey, was it a voluntary or involuntary decision right, from his you parents? attend the school? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that would be mandatory, like just for uh, my kids. Every, every kid had to go to school. And the Ogogi Post, if you think of the map of Canada and you have Hudson's Bay way up in the north, and then at the bottom of that, we have James Bay. His community is a very short distance away from James Bay. And there's be and, and it's it's a fly-in community. So having a school there just wouldn't make any sense at all. And so if you're gonna have a significant number of students requiring residential school, you might as well have them all in the same school. So whether it's a one-hour train ride or in his case, a 10-hour train ride they're still going to that same school. But his when he his body was taken home, his father decided that he was keeping the daughters with him and nobody questioned his right to say, my daughters are not going back to the school. So as I, I wouldn't use the word compulsion, but if the child is to benefit from education, he has to go to a school. <laughs> and, and he was absolutely free to come and go as he pleased. The school is about a half hour walk from downtown Kenora. And kids would always be going downtown either to hang out in the mall, to, to visit some friends. Uh, we They even had a trap line, the senior boys, which extended all the way around Kenora. In addition to that, he's going to a public school, not on a bus. He walked about 10 minutes to the school. There was nothing to prevent him or any other student instead of going to school to take off up the railway tracks and 
and run away. So, and in fact, they didn't even lock the doors at night. And the principal, who knew how restless the kids were when they came back from summer vacations because they were on the reserve, no restrictions, they would be wandering in the bush when they should be in class. He actually arranged for sandwiches to be left at certain spots so they wouldn't go hungry because he knew they'd be home at the school in time for dinner. So to, to as the, the Charlie Wenjack book, um, Secret Path does, to make this look like some sort of a prison is just bizarre. They're, 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 they were perfectly free to come and go, provided it wasn't class. And when he left, it was a Sunday afternoon. Um, one of the remarkable passages I find in the book is that um, I think it, it was at the end of chapter five, um, the girls who were attending at the school, uh, on the other hand, sometimes asked uh, Robinson, uh, I believe he worked at the school, not to send them home for the holidays, but to help them find summer jobs. Some were afraid yes. their fathers would arrange marriages for them. They wanted yes. to stay at school. And it's a yes. remarkable detail. Um, That's absolutely true. Um, and in fact, we have letters from parents who had gone to the school and one of them, and, and who had children in the school, and one of them said that she could have gone home for Christmas, but she would rather stay at the school. We have letters from girls who went home for the summer vacation and were absolutely um, appalled at the drunkenness, at the violence, and what have you, and desperately wanted to get back to the school. So for a sig not for all, but for a significant number of those children, that school was home, was the safest place they'd ever felt being safe in. And um, yes, you're quite right. Some of them were afraid if they went home, their dad would say, you're marrying Harry Jones, and that's the end of it. Yes. You know, um, there's this uh, myth that I hear in my years uh, of studying a trend, uh, that is the myth of generational trauma. So... Um, you know, uh, they would say that today's is problems that affect indigenous communities, um, say drunkenness and poverty, are the result of traumas they inherited from their ancestors who who were being um, subjected to oppression and subjugation and uh, the residential school system by uh, the whites. And uh, I, I, I don't think you can attribute those two together, but... How would you attribute the causes of um, today's um, you know, problems which are affecting indigenous communities? Well, let me first briefly deal with the one about the intergenerational trauma. Uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that some of the abuse and the abusive behavior that they were subjected to in the school was passed on in some cases to the children. But when we talk about the residential schools being the causal effect of dysfunction on the reserves. The reality is that in the 1830s, the main reason that Ojibwe missionary Peter Jones, who was also a chief, and the others wanted the residential schools was because of the dysfunction that already existed on the reserves. And in effect, they saw the schools as a refuge for some children who were a, with drunken parents, violence, what have you. And while we take on Sir John and MacDonald for being a racist and wanting to separate the children from the parents, that's word for word what Peter Jones said back in the 1840s. He said, we have to separate those children from their parents. That's Ontario. Go to Alberta, the Blackfoot, when... One missionary arrived there in 1861. He said they were the most opulent people on the prairies. Um, one of the chiefs had 10 wives and 100 horses and two lodges to carry all his stuff. But then the American whiskey trainers arrived on the scene. And the next thing you know, their society was totally broken down. They were dying frozen in the, um, in the snow. And as a result of that, Sir John A. Macdonald formed the Northwest Mounted Police that went there and chased the whiskey traders out. 
And during the treaty negotiations, Chief Crowfoot said, if it hadn't been for the police, we would all be dead by now. So there you have, in the 1860s, 20, 30 years before the residential schools that were set up at McDonald are in existence, a band, a tribe, totally dysfunctional. So that was not because of residential schools. So I, so I think, number one, yes. Do we have total dysfunctional reserves? Yes, because we have an apartheid-like segregation system. There's really not that much difference between those reserves and the townships that they had in South Africa. They have been separated by race. Many of the bands that I've been to, 94% of the money is a welfare check from the government. The nearest jobs are maybe 70 or 100 miles away. I was at a graduation ceremony at White Dog, which is just north of Kenora in 2013. And here were these really bright, ambitious kids with their cell phones, et cetera. But where are they going to get jobs? They're, they're, there's nowhere there to get a job. And so if you read the treaties, there was never, ever any intention that we'd have reserves like we have today. The whole purpose was that each family of five would be given sufficient land, seed, and implements to become self-supporting by cultivating the soil instead of chasing after the buffalo that are no longer there, just like the Ukrainians and all the others who came. But for some or other, we wound up now with these more than 600 bands, 125, 2,000, 5,000 at tops, maybe 10,000, with no potential for jobs, no proper water, no nothing. So I think former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1967 said, we can't have people living in ghettos like that. We have to give them the opportunity to come and be part of the larger society. So to your question, the residential schools, the last of which closed quite some time ago, having a bad effect, yes, but the dysfunction on the reserves, those reserves shouldn't be there in the first place because most of them have just, there's nothing there. I have a friend who was who went to a McGill University, became the first indigenous lawyer in Canada back in 1955 or something. And he said, why would I live at Red Pheasant? He said, I could just as well have been born in China. This is his quote. But, but would, I, would I have to live in China? No, you don't. He said, there's nothing on the reserves. And he got badly punished by the indigenous groups for supporting the 1969 white paper, which put integration ahead of segregation. And even today, as you know, from going to Trent, we have the Assembly of First Nations all the Assembly of First Nations speaks about is the reserves and the bands. They don't address the problems of the actual majority of Indigenous people who are living in the urban centers and need help in transitioning from living on the reserve to the city life. So if I was the Prime Minister, I would start the immediate process of shutting down the reserves. You want to go back there for your summer holidays? Great. But if you want to support yourself, you have to get a job. There are no jobs there. Go to where the jobs are. All right. Um, so what sort of education uh, would uh, Charlie Wenjack have received uh, during his tenure at Cecilia Jeffrey? Charlie didn't go to school until he was nine. And it's my understanding that he was a very slow learner. They had him in a special class. So at 12 years old, he would have had three years of education, which is not very much at all. Um, and um, tell me about the, the day when he uh, ran off of school. Uh, you mentioned there were three adults who last saw him. Um, who were they and uh, why did they not interfere in his path. Okay. At the back of the school, towards the lake, there's the playground. 
and there's a swing set there. And Charlie was on the swings with 13-year-old Ralph McDonald and his 11-year-old brother, Jackie. Ralph hated school. This was October. He ran away three times already that term. His brother played hooky on a regular occasion, and Charlie had never attempted to run away from the school. Ralph is bored out of his mind, and he likes trapping with his uncle. So he says, let's go and visit our uncle. And the other brother says, yes. So according to Charlie's best friend, who testified at the inquest, he said, when the brother decided to go, Charlie decided, hey, it's a nice sunny day, and let's all go. So he they, they could have been walking out to go downtown, walking off the grounds to go downtown. They could have been going to the bush, and it turns out they were going. So there'd be absolutely no reason for anyone to say, hey, hey, where, where, where are you going? It, it was perfectly normal on a Sunday for the kids to go wherever they want. So on that first night, they wind up at a white man's cabin. He lets them sleep on the floor. And then the next morning, they're at the uncle's cabin, which is about 30 kilometers north of Kenora. Now, there's where, the, according to a McLean's article, which came out in February 1967, and the reporter interviewed the uncle and his wife, um, Charlie felt out of place because his two friends are nephews. His best friend arrives on the Monday. He is a nephew. There are two daughters, two teenage daughters. And all of a sudden, according to the McLean's reporter, he started feeling kind of out of place, like I really don't belong here. And I don't think they made any attempt to make him feel at home. And on the fourth day, on the Thursday, the uncle decides to take the nephews out trapping with him. And they're in a canoe. And he says, Charlie, there's no room for you in the canoe. So he played for a while. And then he decided that he was going to go to the place where they were. And he was there that night. And then the next morning, the father said, sorry, the uncle said, hey, there's still no room for you in the canoe. It's, it's OK. I'm going to go and visit my dad. Now, his dad is 600 kilometers away. 10 hours in a train, 45 minutes on a plane. He has no money. He has no food. And all he has is a light uh, jacket to protect himself. And instead of saying, oh, no, son, no, you, you can't do that. He said that he showed him a path down to the railway tracks and said, ask the railway workers along the road to give you something to eat. And that, to me, and that, by the way, is something that the, in, the inquest jury did not hear. And if they had heard that, he would probably be put in jail because what he did was absolutely, totally irresponsible. And just one last thing, the principal, who happened to be an indigenous person, a Cree from uh, out in uh, Saskatchewan, he knew that Charlie was had an uncle. Well, sorry, the, the boys had an uncle. On the Thursday morning, he knocked on the cabin door and said, is Charlie here? And the wife said, haven't seen hiding a hair of him, nor of my nephews. He'd been with her since Monday morning. He's less than five kilometers away safely with the trapper husband, and she doesn't tell them. So that, that boy did not have to die. And this last thing, they could have written a tremendous story about the true story of Charlie Wenjack. I get quite moved when I read the story, but instead they concocted this nonsense about nuns and priests and a pedophile chasing him all over the place and changing his name. It's it's just not it's not right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um and of course um just to uh reiterate the point, um he was he did not suffer any abuse of any kind during his stay at Cecilia Jeffrey. There is no evidence of him being physically, emotionally or, or sexually abused. Was he lonely? Absolutely. He was desperately lonely. If that little boy had a chance, he'd be at home with his father, with his dog, and he'd be fishing. The last place he probably wanted to be was at that school. 
but not because anybody was abusing him. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, um, given how recent in history he passed away, he wouldn't have been alive today. There's no reason that I can see why, the, like the inquest jury, they wrote in their judgment that the white man at whose cabin he stayed should have notified the police or the school, that the Ojibwe trapper whose cabin he stayed, they should have reported him either to the school or to the, uh, the police. They didn't do that. If they had done that, if, for example, the wife had said to the principal, oh, yeah, fine, he's, he's, he's having a good time here. He's just up there with my uncle, uh, with, my, with my husband and my nephews, and uh, they should be home. You want to go up there and see them? Why couldn't she do that? And the principal would then have said, hey, Charlie, we're going back to the school, and he would have gone back to the school. If the older friends had said, I'm just sick and tired of trapping. Well, we're not there are no beavers here to trap anyway. Let's go back to the school and you know, we'll take whatever's coming to us. But I'm bored out of my mind. He'd have gone back to the school with them. Okay. So finally and he'd be alive. Yes. So finally, uh, how should uh the story of Charlie and of course not Cheney Wenjack be remembered? It should be remembered as a totally preventable death of a lovely little boy who did not deserve in the first place to be at a school 600 miles, 600 kilometers away from his home. Um, but he could and should have had a good life. I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Show.